This chapter will cover survey research. If you remember this from the last lecture, uh, most surveys that we're going to discuss are correlational research, where you're assessing the relationship among naturally occur occurring variables. So the goal of these is to make predictions based on correlation. Um, remember that a correlation coefficient measures the direction and magnitude of a relationship between two variables. Typically, we're talking about two variables within the same person. Um, so um, this is a perfect positive correlation um, where the higher the person scores on X, the higher they are on Y. More likely in social science, we would still consider this a very strong positive correlation. So this might be something. So the perfect positive would be plus one. Mos modest positive might be something like 0.7 or 0.8. This is what it would look like if there were no correlation between the variables. Um, and then the negative correlation means that as one variable increases, the other one decreases. So this would be a perfect negative correlation of minus one. Um, this is, again, more likely a very strong correlation, negative correlation in the social sciences. So this would be maybe minus 0.7 um, or minus 0.65. And so you can see that there. Okay, so in survey research, what we do is we are using a sample to represent a larger population. Um, if uh, I am interested in, um, you know, if I work at a college that has 10,000 students in it and I might want to do a survey about those students' attitudes about a new policy, it might not be possible to collect data from every single student at the school. Um, instead, I might collect a sample of that population that I hope will represent the views of everyone. So maybe I select 50 students and ask them about their perspectives on the policy. Um, so what we're worried about here is representativeness, which is the extent to which the sample has the same distribution of characteristics as the population from which it was selected. If the college has 10,000 students and the students were 70% female, um, but in our sample of 50 students, um, they were only 30% female, then it's not going to be very representative necessarily. And if it's not representative, then we can't generalize. So the goal with sampling is to be able to generalize our survey findings from the sample to the population. We're going to assume that the people we have surveyed represent the population as a whole. So um, similarly, you know, if we want to do a study about perspectives in the United States as a whole, we can't assess every single person in the United States, but we might take a small sample and hope that that sample looks and, and thinks like the rest of the country. So um, some basic terms uh, of sampling. Um, first is the, the population. Okay, so this is the set of all cases of interest. Who do you want to generalize it to? Um, the sampling frame is a list of members of a population. So let's say I want to do a study about how many hours of coursework every person in the class is taking. Okay, so my population would be our class. Um, in terms of the sampling frame, I need a list of all members of our population. Well, the roster would work well as a sampling frame, um, but there are some pros and cons, right? If everyone's registered for the class and the roster is great, but maybe there's somebody in here who's auditing who wouldn't be included on an official course roster. Um, then I don't wanna waste class time, so I don't wanna take the whole class asking every single person, so I need to find a sample. And so a sample is a subset of a population drawn from the sampling frame. So maybe I let you do some in-class group work and um, I just ask one group that finishes early how many classes they're taking um, or how many hours of coursework they're taking. And my hope is that that group represents or looks very similar to the class as a whole. Okay, so that would be my sample. And then the element is each member of the population, each individual. So it's important to remember here that populations, not the samples, are really what we're interested in. Our samples are only as good as they are representative of the population. Okay, so here's an example here. Our population, who we really want to talk about, might be all students on campus. Our sampling frame, so our list of everyone in the population, might be the registrar's list of currently enrolled students. Might not be perfect, but that's probably going to be the closest we can get. 
We can't assess every one of those students, so we might take a sample of 100 students, and then each single student that participates is an element. So there's a couple of approaches that we can take to sampling. So sampling is the process of getting your sample. And there's two approaches, either non-probability or probability. Non-probability does not guarantee that every part of the population has an equal chance. Okay, so there's no guarantee that everyone might get included in the study. Um, so one way we might do this, a common way to do this is convenience sampling, where we select respondents based on availability and willingness to respond. So often TV or newspapers might do this, see, you know, stop random people on the street, um, call in radio shows, um, things like that. Um, even a participant pool at like large universities where they have many um, studies going on and they ask undergraduate students to participate, um, it's going to be, it's kind of getting whoever is around. So if we are doing a convenient sample, um, we're going to assume um, that our survey results probably won't be representative of the population. We assume there's some kind of bias unless there's strong evidence confirming representativeness. In contrast, the gold standard is probability sampling. So for each element of the population, researchers can um, calculate how likely it is that somebody will be in the, the sample, okay? So everyone in the population has an equal chance of being selected two approaches to this. One is a simple random sample where every element, meaning every individual, has an equal chance of being included. So maybe I get a list of students who are currently registered and use a random number generator to select ID numbers. Okay, so it's truly random. Um, another approach is a stratified random sample. Um, so here I might divide my population into subgroups and sample proportionally. So maybe whatever I'm studying, I think could be influenced by ethnicity. And my population is 80% European American, 10% African American, and 10% Asian American. And so if I take a sample of 100 people, I will intentionally make sure that 80% of my sample is European American, 10% is African American, and 10% is Asian American. So we might use stratified sampling um, to increase the representativeness of our sample because it's possible that by random chance, if we drew 100 people, we could get 100 people who were European American. It's unlikely, but it's possible. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about research design, which is kind of the plan for conducting a research projects, project. And there's three general types of survey research designs. Um, so one is cross-sectional design. So this is where you take a sample from a population at the same time. So maybe I take a random sample of UVA Y students in 2021. And um, I might uh, describe the population. So I might use these survey responses to describe the population, um, which would be descriptive statistics. Um, I might use them to make predictions for the population using correlation. So um, maybe I expect that students who are higher on depression will be more likely to use alcohol. Um, and I might also use it to compare populations. I might take a sample of students from UVA Wise and a sample from ETSU and see how they compare. But the, the goal is that, you know, I'm taking these samples at one period in time, so I can't assess change over time. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, we have uh, our population that we want to study. We've taken one sample from that population who completes one survey at one point in time. Another approach is uh, successive independent samples design. So here we take a series of cross-sectional surveys over time, but we have different samples or different participants at each point in time. These samples are taken from the same population and are asked the same questions, but it is different people. So we might use this type of survey to describe changes in attitudes or behavior over time. So we often use these kinds of surveys, public opinion polls or approval ratings of Congress um, are, are these kinds of successive independent samples designed. 
The problem, though, is we don't know how the specific individual views have changed because we've got different people answering each time. So the successive samples may not be representative of the same population. So if one time you do a survey of people in New England and then another time you do a sample of people in Texas, it might look that like these opinions have changed, but in reality it's because your samples weren't representative. Um, so this is what the successive independent samples design would look like. You've got all the same population that you're trying to assess. Um, at one time point you take a, a random sample from this population and they do the survey. Um, six months later, you take another different sample from the population and they do the same survey. And then six months after that, you take another sample and they do a different survey. So you're ideally assessing change in attitudes of this same population, but you've got different people reporting on these attitudes. Um, finally, you've got longitudinal survey design where you've got the same sample survey more than once and you have the same people doing the same survey. So this is really where we get at looking at how individuals change over time in both the direction and extent of the change. So when you have longitudinal data, it's much easier to look at the reasons for attitude and behavior changes or to look at the effects of naturally occurring events. Um, but one of the problems is that we can't tell whether individuals change as a result of societal change, right? So if you were doing a longitudinal study um, of children's peer relationships and then schools shut down because of COVID, anything you concluded would be really hard to say, is it because these kids changed because they mature because of development? Or is it because kids changed because there was this magic, ma massive societal change? Um, other issues with survey research design is attrition. So often people are less likely to do a study over time. So you lose people and your sample may be less representative. Um, and also reactivity. So people might change because they're observed. So we try to be consistent um, because we're interested in change. Um, but sometimes, you know, if you give people a survey, a bunch of questions of how they feel about themselves, and then you give them the same survey six months later, they kind of already know what you're studying and that could influence their results. Okay, so this is what a longitudinal survey design looks like. We've got the same population, one big population. We've got a sample from that population and that sample does the same survey three different times. Um, the value of a survey really depends on the quality of the measurements and the instruments. Um, so most surveys are questionnaires where you have a set of predetermined questions for all of the respondents. Um, this can measure any type of variable. Um, you know, you want uh, demographic variables, things like race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, um, preference, attitudes, opinions, things like that. Um, so you can do rating scales. So how positively do you feel about this? How stressful was this event? How do you feel about yourself? Things like that. So there's millions of things that can be assessed through questionnaires. Um, finally, just one thing to kind of think about um, when we're thinking about research though is, is what we can actually conclude from a correlation. So most research studies are correlational, or sorry, most survey studies are correlational. Um, and correlations are really good for description and prediction, but cannot prove causation. So remember that in order to prove causation, we really need an experiment in which we've manipulated something. So if we find a significant correlation, it can tell us a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> so let's say we find an IQ uh, correlation between IQ and emotion regulation. So it might tell us that higher IQ causes better emotion regulation. However, it could also be true that better emotion regulation causes higher IQ. We don't know which of the two variables is causing which. Also, it could be a third factor that causes both. So maybe something like age causes improvements in both emotion regulation and IQ. Um, so this is called a spurious relationship. And so anytime we're interpreting a correlation, we need to be very cautious about our interpretations because of this.